We've seen GBTC and the Grayscale team, they're trying to convert into an ETF. Uh, their most recent application was denied. Uh, and so within hours, they went ahead and they began the process to sue the SEC. Their argument is the SEC has already approved uh, futures-based ETFs, both long and short. There's other spot Bitcoin ETFs around the world. We don't have one here in the United States. I don't know how much you can comment or not, but what's your general take on Bitcoin spot ETF in the United States and maybe Grayscale's chances to be the first to get that conversion? Here's how I look at it from the perspective of, of working in financial services and working within the system on a regulated basis. And I have for years. Suing the SEC is a really bad idea. It, it virtually never works. They have unlimited resources. It's a bravado thing to do. And I'm sure others in the industry are plotting this. But the outcome is never good because they don't like getting sued and they have <laughs> tremendous powers uh, to avoid being embarrassed and it tried to embarrass the regulator into submission. Well, pump that just doesn't work. And so um, this is not the path of least resistance. And I, I do not want to you know, comment on, on, on what they're attempting to do, other than saying, from my point of view, it's a personal opinion, it, it borderlines, it, it, you know, it borders on insanity. Uh, it, it's, it's not a good playbook. And I, if, I think if I were on that board, I would be, I would be pretty noisy in, in, in the boardroom about this. Now, having said all that, I'm a more optimistic on other strategies in terms of getting some policy in crypto. And I, you know, we, we should talk about the next six months because you've got lots of evidence now of bipartisan interest in getting some policy in place not in a combat way by suing regulators, but in a way in cooperation on a bipartisan basis. And let's make it real easy, okay? We're not gonna get everything regulated overnight. We may not get an ETF in the US for two or three more years, but that's not the only thing that matters. What I'd like to see, and a lot of others too, would take one asset, one asset, a really bipartisan asset in the form of stable coin. Now, not all stable coins were created equal. We know the meltdown in Luna, that story is well known. Algorithmic based, you know, stable coins may not be the best idea. It'd be very hard to launch another one. But assets like USDC that are backed by the US dollar have not broken a buck recently. And if that was made, and was allowed to be regulated, it could become the default payment service for the world, backed by the US dollar, because everybody would use it, because so many commodities, including oil, are actually paid in US dollars. Imagine if you could use USDC to transfer between jurisdictions and geographies. It's far more efficient, better ledger, more transparent, lower cost, way faster. What senator doesn't like that idea, making the US dollar king dollar, keeping it at the supreme default currency. I don't care what party you're in, that's a good idea. The policy being proposed by the Toomey and Haggerty bills and even contemplated in the Loomis bill, which has much more than just stablecoin. Let's just take the stablecoin. If Toomey's gonna retire in January, he's, he would endorse this if he could get it passed in the last, by the last end, at the end of this year. It would be a fantastic thing. And everybody in the crypto industry, including all the institutions that don't own it yet, would see the very first marker of policy on a very basic asset, stable coins. And contemplated in the policies, very simple, full audit every 30 days. What's wrong with that? Makes sense to me. And no assets held supporting the token or coin with a duration longer than 12 months. What's wrong with that? That looks like a money market by Fidelity or by Schwab. I've been talking about this now for three months and I'm really working hard going to Washington, trying to do whatever I can as a private citizen to push that agenda. Just one thing, let's get one thing done. And I will also note since you and I last talked that Fidelity and BlackRock each put in $200 million. That's a lot of money into a Series F at Circle. Now that, if that isn't accommodating 
and supporting the notion of a regulated stablecoin, I don't know what is what what isn't. I mean that 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 is as good as it gets. Those are the most conservative financial institutions in the world supporting the idea of a stablecoin backed by the U.S. dollar. Talk to me about disclosures. You mentioned, obviously, Luna. There's a lot of people who had questions there. We've seen many other companies uh, that have struggled over the last couple of months. And it feels like alongside this idea of more regulation is more requirements on uh, the disclosure front. What are you seeing there? What do you think is the likely path that we'll get? There's no question there's going to there's have to be more disclosure. There's going to have to be more transparency. But the truth is, and, th and this is something the entire industry has to really get their head around. If we can get some policy, even though it will require additional compliance costs, more disclosure, more transparency, it opens the floodgates of institutional capital that have been waiting to come into the crypto market. Just in a payment system alone, let's say four or five different stable coins got licensed, it would be a phenomenal outcome because you would, for the first time, be able to get a one or two or three percent indexed allocation from sovereign funds running 500 to 900 billion dollars, the kind of guys that I service in the indexing business. I'm not the only person doing it. There's lots of others. But we talk to these funds all the time and they say the same thing over and over again. Give me some policy. Show me I'm not offside with the SEC and I'll give you a one percent allocation, sometimes a three percent allocation. That goes for Bitcoin, that goes for Ethereum, Solana, Polygon, stable coins. Just give me a regulated position. That's all they want. So for all of the angst and all the headaches and everybody worrying and gnashing their teeth and rubbing their hands together about disclosure, who cares? Let's get this policy done. And if you want, if you want to see Bitcoin $100,000, that's how you're going to do it. You're going to get the sovereign wealth funds to allocate to it. I'm a believer in that. That's why I stay long in these troubled and difficult times, but I'm 100% compliant. Everything I touch is regulated, whether I own an exchange in a country like Canada or I'm trying to buy a license in the UAE, I'm working with the regulator. I don't want to be a crypto cowboy. It just shows you what happens when you're a crypto cowboy, you get wiped out. What are you most worried about over the next, let's call it six to 12 months? What's the thing that you're like, man, people really got to pay attention to this. And I don't think enough people are paying attention to whether it's a risk or a potential surprise on the horizon. So people ask me every hour of the day, are we at the bottom? Is it time to buy? And we're not. And the reason I say that is, let's just talk crypto markets, all crypto markets. I don't care what asset class you're in within crypto markets, what coin, what token, what asset, what project. I don't care. It doesn't matter. We're not at the bottom yet. What defines a good bottom is a panic event. Now, we've had some good bankruptcies, but they're all small. You know, this yesterday's announcement, Voyager, it's irrelevant. It's so small and so decentralized in the sense that the, the shareholders are all over the place. You took that kind of chance with leverage. You got wiped out. Learn. That's the whole point.